Hey there, my name is Danny Libra and I'm the founder of Pest Control SEO, where we grow pest control companies with SEO. Today I'm with Nathan Gotch. Nathan Gotch is one of the top guys in the SEO industry, specifically local SEO. And wow, does this guy have a lot of accolades. He actually just hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. So congratulations, Nathan. Um, Thank you. Has 62,000 followers on LinkedIn, has a book, The SEO Entrepreneur, almost 100 reviews on that. Um, been in SEO for over 10 years is the co-founder of Rankability and is the founder of Gotch SEO Academy. And he's been running that for over 10 years. So, I mean, th this guy knows what he's talking about. I think almost anyone in SEO has seen your YouTube channel by now. Um, and everyone knows you're the real deal. So, so excited to have you on and learn from you, Nathan. My pleasure, super excited to be here. Cool, man. So can you tell me when you first got into SEO about you know 10 years ago or so? <clears throat> Yeah, uh, so I actually got into SEO. So even before I started Gotcha SEO, I, I was already into SEO before I officially like you know actually started a real business. Okay. Um, and so I, I started actually. This was going into my senior year of college. So this is you know I. So my family wanted me to be a lawyer. Okay, that was kind of like the thing, <laughs> and I was gonna like you know I was gonna go that path, go the traditional path, and um, but really what I wanted was to work online. Like I, mm -hmm. I really wanted to do that. And this just kind of stems back from like, I spend most of like middle school and high school just playing online video games. Mm. And so like, I just love the internet, right? Yeah. Like I remember when you like, I always tell people this, but like, I remember when YouTube wasn't even owned by Google. And like, mm. I was, you know, watching UFC highlights on YouTube uh -huh. before it was even owned by Google. Mm -hmm. So it was like a very long time, but I always wanted to work on the internet. So, uh, you know, secretly to a certain extent, I was looking for ways to make money online. And uh, I, I tried so many things. I mean, so many things that didn't work. I did paid surveys. I, I wrote articles, you know, to try to make like AdSense revenue on them. Um, it was actually easy in articles. I don't know if it's still around. And so I did that. And then eventually I found this like really, in hindsight, a really sketchy course called Web Colleagues. Okay. okay. And it was like, I think it was like $47. And this is when I was still in college and I was just broke. So I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this, but I did it anyway. Um, and so I, I went to this course and there was like a bunch of crazy tactics, like, you know, buy bot traffic to your website mm -hmm. and do all these crazy things. But then one thing really popped out to me, which was uh, start a blog. And, uh, to me, I was like, okay, I don't have a ton of skills, uh, at this point in my life, but I do know how to write. I can certainly mm -hmm. write. Cause I was, I was getting my degree in political science. So we would just write constantly. So I was like, all right, I think I can write. But then I had a problem. I was like, well, what do I write about? <laughs> so um, now the good news is I was playing college baseball. So I was like, all right, I feel like I could start a baseball blog. And specifically mm -hmm. the, you know, the position I played was pitching a uh, pitcher. So I started a baseball pitching blog. And uh, as most people might imagine, when you start a website and you have no idea what you're doing, uh, you don't know how to get traffic, right? So I just, I did what everyone claimed you should do, right? Uh, content is king and just write content, <laughs> uh, build it and they will come and you'll be a millionaire. Um, and I did that for many, many months. I created content just like, just pumping it out. And I was like, what, why is this not working? Like I thought I was supposed to be rich by now. What happened? Um, and then come to find out, you know, I went back to Google and then I, I started looking at different techniques. I'm like, oh, this, what's this SEO thing? And I was like, well, I will try this out. So I tried SEO on the website and it started to work. And mm. I, I still remember like getting my first affiliate commission. Like I remember where I was when it happened wow. because it was such like a monumental moment for me. Cause I was like, whoa, I just made money like on my own. That's crazy. Not with a job, not with anything else. Like I made this, you know, a reality. Um, and so when that happened, I, I was hooked. I mean, it only took like, I think my, I think the commission was like uh, 50 bucks or something. But yeah. like, to me, it was like a billion dollars because I was just <laughs> like, this is like incredible, right? That I could do this. And so, and really what got me excited was like, it actually wasn't even the money. It was like, whoa, this SEO thing is crazy. Like I can mm. use this to make money. Like I, mm. I, I realized I made that connection very quickly and I'm like, I'm going to figure out how to do this. Like really, really figure it out. Uh, and so then I spent like, this is like 2011 all the way up until 2013. All I did was work on my own websites. Mm. So just, you know, kept building my own websites. I, I would just launch niche websites just to like refine my SEO skills. And I just kept doing it over and over. 
And then eventually, um, you know, I realized uh, because I followed a lot of other people who said you should do this, which is like, well, you can sell your SEO services to businesses. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, so then I, you know, decided to start doing that. And uh, once again, it's like starting at ground zero because I had no clue what I was doing. So first thing I did is like, all right, well, I'm going to start this. I need to start a website. So I was like, well, I'm super creative here. So I'm going to start Gotch SEO. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just start, use my name and SEO. Um, and so I did that. And then, uh, you know, the next kind of stage of this process was like trying to get clients. So at that time it was, uh, Craigslist, uh, responding to Quora threads, uh, questions, uh, but also doing SEO on my actual website. Um, and come to find out that actually worked weirdly. Um, I, I started to actually like my first pool of clients actually came from Craigslist. Um, and it was, I wouldn't recommend that today, but that, that certainly worked back then because there were businesses that would post gigs and then you could respond to those gigs and that actually did work. And so that, that got me to like just doing Craigslist and like responding to core questions. I got up to like 5,000 a month roughly. And then from there I started doing SEO on my site and I started ranking for St. Louis SEO company. Mm. And that was like, that's when the lid just got blown off in, in the agency. I like, cause then all of a sudden I was like making $18,000 a month. And I'm like, what was going on? <laughs> like, I, I didn't even know it was like, it was crazy. That was crazy money to me at the time because I, I had never made like, I don't know, barely any money ever. Um, and so that was like crazy money to me. And then I was like, all right, this is it. This is what I'm doing. I am going to run this business and this is what I'm doing permanently. Uh, and then we can talk about all the transitions that have been made since then. But that was kind of like the beginning stages there. Um, yeah. So that's how it was. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's actually funny. That's kind of a similar story as me. I, you know, I knew I kind of wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't want to, you know, go the typical nine to five route. And at the beginning of college, I was just finding anything I could do to make money online. So what I did, and it's kind of the same story. And like, the, I remember exactly where I was for this. Um, the first time I made money online was I got like a random Upwork job for a hundred dollars to give someone a list of like 3000 curse words. Like you can't, you can't make this up <laughs> like just the most random thing, but just even that little validation of knowing like like, whoa, this is actually real. This is not like some kind of joke. People are actually making money online because, you know, you see all the gurus yeah. on the internet. I mean, people now see you as a guru and they're like, dude, Nathan Gotch is making all this money, you know, come on, I, I can never be like him. But once you just make a sliver of money, you're like, this is actually possible. So it's all um, I, I, yeah, I love that um, kind of sym symmetry in our journey. And um, relating, or not relating to that, but I want to ask you, cause it seems like you're really focused on local now. Were you doing like local back then or what kind of clients were you taking on? Uh, I was taking anything that would come my way. So it was, and, and by the way, I don't recommend that like that, like in, in my book, I teach a totally like what you're <laughs> doing in your agency is the right thing to do. Like picking a niche and, and building a brand in that one niche. That's the way to do it. But for me back then, I, my mind was just, how do I get cash? Mm. Right. And so I brought everyone, it didn't matter. So I would work with a plumber one day and the next day I would work with a, a company that sells rugs, right? Mm. So it was all over the place. Um, and that's fine in the beginning, like for an agency, like it's fine, like bring people on, get the experience, get the cash flow, so you have some security. That's all good stuff. But long term, it's actually very detrimental, mm. very detrimental because it, it, it actually will inhibit you from scaling. Because the problem is every time you bring on a new campaign, it's like you're starting from scratch, right? And mm. so like for you, for example, you know, you have the pest control, like specific focus. Yeah. Um, every time you bring on a campaign, you, there's kind of a similar process. Mm -hmm. you, know what mm -hmm. to, you know what to look for. You understand the industry. Things move a lot quicker, which then allows you to scale a lot better. Um, but, you know, and then on top of it, not just on the fulfillment side, but also on the uh, marketing side. It gets really hard when you're just like the SEO company, mm -hmm. right? Like that becomes very challenging. Uh, and that's what I was. I was like, I guess technically I, I, I did pick a sliver of a niche was like, I was just going to dominate St. Louis. So that was mm -hmm. my goal. Okay. Like I'm just going to dominate St. Louis. And that was my focus. And that actually worked, like I said, to bring in a decent amount of revenue, but I wouldn't recommend that strategy long term. Right. Like I think everyone should in the beginning take what you can get, but you know, the long-term objective should be like, okay, what are these, what are these industries I like to work in? 
Mm. Right. And so like maybe you like working with lawyers, maybe you like working with SaaS companies, whatever it is, but figure out what that is and then kind of start to pivot towards, you know, that particular industry. Cause that, that is really the only way long-term to, to build this the right way. I think in my opinion, personally. Yeah. No, so. awesome. That That's very affirming. And that's basically kind of the consensus that I've heard from all the top people in the space. Everyone is saying niche down. And yeah. When I was starting out, I mean, I, I had a agency before this one called Full Funnels, and I was just doing basically websites and SEO, like basically any kind of digital marketing for anyone. So it was so broad, was doing whatever I could and was getting, you know, very bad clients and it was hard to make a name for myself. And also, yeah. I think the market is so competitive now, like I, I'm sure it's different back when you were doing it, you know, 10 years ago, I'm sure there were much less SEOs in the space, but I know so many SEOs, like there are so many people that are trustworthy, so many agencies that are crushing it. And, you yeah. know, maybe they're niche down to home services or, you know, local businesses, whatever. And the typical business owner, they're going to pick them over you if you're just like some random guy. But For sure. if if you do go niche, then you can become the number one in the industry, which is, you know, my goal. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm just I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, well, and it's it's actually like people don't realize how much easier it actually is to niche down. So like, much easier. The 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 thing is, they the fear is that if you niche down, you're reducing your opportunity, mm -hmm. right? That that's the that's the idea, but it's actually not true at all. Uh, and I think this this kind of goes back to like you know a lot of these uh, self help gurus, right? They they all focus on like think big, ten x, do all yeah, these huge yeah. things. And it's like, actually in business, you don't want to do that. You actually want to do the opposite. You want to like find one little pocket and like really dominate that one little pocket and then move on to the next thing and expand that way. You don't like Amazon didn't become Amazon overnight, mm. right? They, they started in one little pocket, just selling books. They did that really, really well, better than anyone could ever do it. And then well, now we see the result of that, but, <laughs> but the point is, is like it, it, having that hyper focus, it makes a significant difference. Like I use a, in the book, I actually use an example for, um, you know, is it easier to compete against the 40,000 SEO agencies that exist in the United States who target everyone basically? Mm -hmm. There's about 40,000 according to clutch. If you go to clutch, it's about like 40 K okay. um, or how many SEO companies are there for endodontists? Mm. <laughs> like. 10? Do you know any? I mean, I don't know. No. Any. I mean, I, I no. mean, on one hand, you pick any, basically any niche, aside from maybe personal injury, you're you're probably mm. not going to find more than five to ten companies that specifically specialize in that one industry, right? Just mm -hmm. or or just specific niche. Um, you're just not going to find it. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. So so yeah. No, I I have like searched out and basically found everyone in pest control marketing, everyone that's pest control marketing, not even pest control SEO. There's about five or six. Yeah. Like that, that's I how bet I bet there's less than 10. I bet there's less yeah, than 10. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. very small. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of the, the way I can compete, which, you know, is awesome. And also it makes it much easier for me. Like I said, I mean, I don't want to harp on this too much, but I mean, I think there's still even a ton of variability. Like I have a client that is doing, a hundred K a year. And I have a client that's doing $90 million a year. So there's even a lot of variability in that. So, I mean, imagine yeah. like what you were doing of like a, a random rug company and a random plumbing company and a like software company, yep. like e-com, whatever it, it gets very, very complex and it makes it very hard to scale. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's awesome that you agree with that model. Um, yeah. I'm curious well, when did just, you, I was going to say just to add to that point, because the, the hardest thing about my previous model, was like every time I'd get a new client, I'd have to learn their industry. Mm, yeah. Like, I don't know anything about rugs. So all of a sudden I have to figure out what, like, what are, I don't understand anything about rugs. I basically have to educate. And back then I didn't have chat GPT, right? So mm. it wasn't, it wasn't like I could just go into chat GPT and figure it out super quickly. Like I had to manually figure all this stuff out. So mm -hmm. that's another, people don't consider that part. Like the education of a new industry is very hard. There's a lot of nuance. Like, um, I have a client in the fire protection services industry. I mean, it's taken me basically a couple of years to just figure out that industry because it's mm. so complex. There's so many nuances and they just made, that was like that one client made me realize like, man, this is why you have to niche down because it's just uh -huh. so difficult. So anyway, I know you're gonna ask me a question. We'll keep going. Cool. Yeah, no, I, I want to <clears throat> learn about the evolution of Gotch SEO. So you started out kind of taking all kinds of different clients. What were the first few years like? And, you know, now you've been 
running it for over 10 years. Tell me about it. Yeah. So from basically from 2013, uh, which is when it became an official LLC. Um, actually, sorry, that that's not right. Gotcha CEO became official. I became an LLC in 2014. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> but, but basically from 2013 until 2016 was all agency. I didn't do anything else. I only did client services. That was all I did. Um, and during that period, I realized, uh, I don't totally love it. Right. It wasn't <laughs> really like my thing. Like, yes, it made me good money. Yes. It was you know, a great thing for many, many reasons, but, um, I always had the ambition to want to start like a course or start a mm. training program. Like I always wanted to do that uh, mm. because it, I felt that it kind of aligned better with my skill set, uh, which is education and teaching. Like it's kind of my thing um, that I at least am decent at, right? Mm. And um, I, and I have nothing against agency. I think agency is like a beautiful business model, um, but there is kind of like over time there is an evolution with entrepreneurship and. Uh, client services, you know, it has its challenges, right? It's it's uh, it, it's not truly scalable, right? Mm. Like scale and agency do not go together because <laughs> um, because for for true scalability to occur, like revenue and expenses must go in the opposite direction, right? Mm. So like as revenue climbs, expenses go down with scale, but agency, it's not like that. Like revenue grows, but so do expenses <laughs> at the same speed. Right, because you need people, and it, and then so it, it's not a, you can grow an agency, but you can't really scale an mm. agency in, in, by by definition, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, in 2016, I was like, all right, I'm gonna try, like, I want to start my own course. So I started Gotcha SEO Academy, um, and I launched the first version of it, and I was deathly afraid to be on video, uh, and this is just because, uh, not to get too granular here, but. When I was running my agency, I signed up for the Yelp, uh, uh, like advertising program. Mm -hmm. And basically what that was is like, you would, you sign up for Yelp, you pay, I think it was like $300 a month. And they basically push you up towards the top on Yelp. And I was like, ah, I'll give it a shot. Uh, but one of the things that they did was they came to your office and record a video of you. Mm. And I figured like, I thought this was going to be like a highly produced thing. Like I was like, oh yeah, like they're going to come in. It's going to be like a script and all this stuff. Yeah. And like, the guy shows up and he's like, all right, here we go. And he's got like the camera on me. And I'm like, but what you want me to just like go on the fly? Like I it was totally unprepared. I didn't like when that camera hit me, I was like a deer in the headlights. Like mm. I just, nothing was going on up here. And after that was over, I was like, I am never, I'm just never doing video. Like mm. I'm just not going to do it. Like, I just was so, it just it was very damaging mentally. Mm. Um, and so eventually though, uh, so in 2016, so going back to the reason why I'm telling you this is because in 2016, when I launched the first version of the Academy, it was all text. It was not video. It was literally <laughs> like, it was basically a series of blog posts that I had, and they were different than my blog. Like I had actually like written them out specifically for the training, but I had like, I think I had like seven people join and I got like two refunds. So I ended up with like five net sales from that. <laughs> um, and I was like, man, this is, whew, that was pretty brutal. But then like, I, I realized like, okay, I have to do video. Like I, I have mm. to get over myself. I have to get over this fear. I have to get over this whole thing. So, uh, the way I kind of, uh, transitioned into it was I started doing over the shoulder videos. So I would just like record my screen, like, all right, here's how to do a screaming frog on it. Like go in here and do it. And I would just do that. Right. I didn't show my face though. It was just my voice. Um, and at that time I had no idea that audio was important. So I would basically just use the microphone in my computer yeah, yeah. to record the over the shoulder. And so it sounded like trash. Mm -hmm. So then I, so I recorded like hundreds of videos though, uh, with that style. Uh, and then I relaunched the Academy and it did much better that time. It did much mm -hmm. better. I think I maybe did like 15,000 in a week or something. And to me, I was like, whoa. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool um, at the time. So then I, for the next launch, I was like, all right, these videos, I need to go to the next level. I re-recorded every single video, but this time I had a microphone. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. And so I basically just like took, I changed some stuff, but I, I basically took the similar and re-recorded them, made them better. Uh, and then I relaunched the Academy again. So then I kept doing this kind of open and close model with the Academy from like 2016 until 2021. 
And that was the model that I kept using. Uh, and then in uh, 2018 was the, was the craziest decision that most people would look at as being very stupid. Okay. This is a decision and I do not recommend this decision for most people. Um, I am definitely a very risk tolerant type of person. So like I can burn the boats and, yeah, and yeah. still sleep at night. Uh -huh. Okay. And, so I don't recommend it, but, uh, and for many reasons, but the, what I did is like, I was so fed up with client work that I just quit. I just straight up like in 2018, I called all of my clients and I said, guys, I'm done. I, I can't, I just, I'm going to, I'm just going to focus on the Academy. That's all. I'm Dang. Gonna do. And, uh, in hindsight, that was rough. I mean, I lost <laughs> serious, serious amount of cash flow from doing mm. that, like a lot. And mm -hmm. I felt it. I felt the squeeze. I was like, yikes, that was okay. But you know, to me, that was what I needed to do. I needed to do that so I could really mm -hmm. focus on the Academy. So then like from 2018 until 2021, basically it was all Academy. I just like mm -hmm. went all in focused on it and it got significantly better. Um, but it wasn't actually until 2021 until it, it went to the next level. Mm -hmm. And it was then when I decided that I'm like, okay, um, this is actually kind of a revelation that occurred by the way, not to kind of extend this really far, but with courses, um, there's a statistic that floats around that only 10% of people who take courses actually finish it. Okay. Oh. So 10% of online courses, that's it, right? 10% of people actually finish a course. So when I saw that statistic, I was like, there's no way that happens in my course. I'm like, there's no mm. way people don't do that. Or like, like, of course my ego. And then, uh, <laughs> so, so I, I go and look, I go and look at this, the back end statistics and I start looking and I'm like, what? And I do the math and it was like 18% of people finished my course. And I was like, what, why? Like I, I was so flabbergasted. I couldn't mm -hmm. believe that people wouldn't go through. Cause I'm like, if you just go through it, like you're going to get results. Like mm -hmm. I, I almost guaranteed if you go through this whole thing, you implement, you will get results. So it actually, it made me super frustrated. But I was like, I need to fix this problem. So, uh, I eventually, uh, got in touch with my now partner, uh, his name's Simon. And, um, at the time he had been, uh, with another training program, uh, and they did something really, really unique, which was they had these coaching calls twice a week. Mm. And so I talked to him, he's like, yeah, the way we're going to fix this is we're going to have more touch. We're going to have more support. Mm. We're going to have more. And I was like, man, twice a week. Oof, I don't know if I can do that. Like, that's pretty rough. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wasn't doing anything right. Like I was just had like, it was like course and Facebook group. That was it. Right. Like the traditional model. Um, so we, so, but I made the decision and I, I added the coaching calls twice a week. We moved off of Facebook, built it, put it into custom platforms. So the community zone, a custom platform. Um, and then I started doing these coaching calls twice a week, starting in 2021 It's actually May of 2021. And, uh, man, the results were like insane just mm. insane. I mean, we literally went from basically an 18% completion rate to now our completion rates are about 80%. I mean, it's just wow. crazy. And it's, and, and of course I attribute it to that because when someone goes through my training, which now I've updated twice since 2021, <laughs> um, because of AI, um, when people go through my training, you know, if they hit a roadblock or they hit something, they can actually just go and ask me a question every mm. Tuesday and Thursday. Right. Mm. So going back to what I said, like, I didn't want to do those coaching calls. Well, now I've done almost 400. So, wow. you know, it's like, it, it works and that's why I do it. And I actually do it in rankability too. So now I actually have three coaching calls a week. I have Tuesday, Wednesday's the rankability <laughs> call and then Thursday's the, another Academy call. Um, so I do three a week now. So, but that's because they're so incredibly helpful for the members. Right. So, Anyway, I know that was a long answer, but that that's just kind of like the evolution of what that looks like. So, no, that was great. And also, kind of going off of that, I'm I'm curious. I I just want to learn more, and also, I mean, potentially get you sales. Who, like, what? Yeah, who is Gotch SEO Academy for, and what will they learn? I mean, it's obviously for anyone that wants to, uh, you know, improve their SEO performance using a systematic process, right? So that's the one thing that makes it very unique in what I teach is I, uh, I don't teach theory, right? Like you're not going to come into my training and like, 
here's you know the this patent that I found and try to die. It, no, it's just like this is what you do from the beginning of a campaign to the end of a campaign. It's all action. Every every single lesson has an SOP. Like it's it's pretty intense. Um, but as far as like the ideal person that joins, uh, it's agencies, right? It's uh, service mm -hmm. providers, and I'd say that's probably like at this point probably ninety percent is that. Uh, ninety percent is agency owners, um, and funny enough, like they're all kind of competing against each other to a certain extent with <laughs> yeah. their clients. Um, but you know, there's there's so much opportunity that you know, it. it, it the, I, I have a very abundance mentality, so I, I don't view it that way. So yeah, cool, awesome. And now tell me about Rankability. So I think you've been running that for about three or four years. You co-founded it. How did that come about? Did did, did you come up with the idea? And you know, how's it going? Yeah. Um, so, so we, we technically launched, uh, this year in March. So that was oh, like really? opening up to the public. Yeah. In March. Um, and prior to that, we had basically, it had been in development for about, I think it was about a year. So hmm. we had basically weren't taking on any customers for about a year, which is very counterintuitive to what most SaaS recommendations are, right? Most SaaS mm -hmm. recommendations are get that MVP out, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. get people to break it, like do all that. And you know, I, we just didn't want it to go that route. We wanted to build something out of the gate that like people could really use and was already good just immediately. Um, and so the reason why we even built it in the first place was I, I always wanted to start a software, right? And like, I always wanted to build my own software, but I, I never found any opportunity or like pocket that made sense. Like, Ahrefs is so good. SEMrush is so good. Like, you know, you look at them and you're like, man, they, they're just good. Like they're, they're good at what they mm -hmm. do. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. it was never a time where I was like, Ooh, I see a gap in the market that I can go and exploit. It wasn't until though I started using uh, a content optimization tool. I won't name it, but, uh, I started using it a lot, like a ton. And, um, I was able to get results very good, like very well with it, right? When I would create the content, but then what happened is, uh, I had team members who use the tool and I just kind of expected that they would understand that you shouldn't necessarily follow some of the recommendations, like so literally, right? And mm. so uh, a lot of the content optimization tools on the market, what they do is they say, uh, if you're targeting blue shoes, you need to mention blue shoes seven times. And then mm. you, it, oh, yellow shoes, you need to mention that nine times, yeah. right? And and so what happened was like, my team member would go in and just like look for areas to inject and keyword stuff basically. And so mm. we did this, like I, I, I basically let this team member loose on many, many uh, keywords and we created hundreds of pieces of content. And I sat back one day and I started to reflect on the results and I'm like, I, this doesn't make sense. Like, why are we optimizing content, but the results are not that good? Mm -hmm. And I started to dig, I started to really dig in, like really, really dig in and come to find out, I realized that the reason was because all of this content was keyword stuff. And mm -hmm. it, it was triggering Google's algorithm and it was, and it was, Google did not like that at all. And so what I started to do is I started to test an alternative strategy which was, okay, take all the topics that the competitors are talking about, right? They're talking about blue shoes and yellow shoes and kids' blue shoes, whatever it is. But instead of thinking about how many times can I inject this into the content, let's just try to cover this topic without any, mm. like, don't even care how many times we mention it. Just, mm -hmm. we just want to cover it. If it takes a sentence to cover it, that's great. If it takes nine paragraphs to cover it, perfect, right? It doesn't matter. The word count doesn't matter. The, uh, the quantity at which you mention it doesn't matter. So I started testing this and I revised all of those articles myself manually. Uh, and I went through and revised all and checked the results and they all improved in performance. So basically wow. I reduced optimization and improved performance. And uh, so then I was like, ah, I found a gap. <laughs> mm. um, so basically what I did is I wanted to create a tool that was more in line with my philosophy uh, and my strategies that I know work. Um, and so then that's what we did. We're like, we're going to create this content op optimization tool based on the systems and the results that we've gotten, you know, in our process. 
Um, and so now that's, that's kind of what this has turned into. Um, and it works like I, in the, in the, um, in the coaching calls for rankability, I actually have what I call like the gotch SEO lab. And I, I show the key words that I'm optimizing starting in, uh, December, I show like, okay, this is where I was with the score. It was like, let's say the rankability score was a 12. Now it's an, uh, an 80. Right. Mm. And then I show like the results, like document everything. And like the, the success rate, like the ranking improvement success rate is like 98% from using rankability. So, wow. I mean, I, like, I, I feel bad saying this cause it just seems so unrealistic. Like, like the, the, the result, but the numbers don't lie. And uh, you can actually, mm. funny enough, you can go back cause we record all the coaching calls. You can go back and timestamp when I showed specific keywords and look at them today. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You'll see it. Not lying. So, so anyway, that that was the main catalyst for it. Is like I wanted to build something that I wanted really. Like I wanted a mm. tool that I really wanted to use. And now it's crazy because it, I actually use rankability myself more than any other SEO tool because I'm just creating content, right? So like right now I'm writing a huge, you know, content about uh, e-commerce SEO, right? Mm. Huge asset, and like I'm in there multiple hours a day just pounding away on this so um so yeah it's pretty crazy but it's fun it's super fun yeah so no yeah going off of that um of like the quality content aspect i was actually just watching you on a podcast earlier today and this like blew my mind i you said that you were spending 20 to 25 hours per blog on your own website i, I think that most people just can't even fathom that they're thinking like maybe a few hours can you tell me what goes into those hours and what exactly makes quality content? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely a loaded <laughs> question for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so when, when, when I am the one writing the content, like when I'm actually going with my fingers on the keyboard, I'm probably spending, depending on the complexity of the asset, I mean, at least 15 hours, at least. Wow. Uh, some are longer. I mean, some could be 30 hours uh, and then. Now, the, what takes a long time um, is when I, f so first of all, I, I, I don't target every keyword, right? Like if, I, if mm -hmm. I find a keyword, the first thing that I do is I look at the competition and I'm not, yes, I'm looking at the links and all these other kind of qu uh, quantifiable metrics. Yes, I am looking at that, but I'm actually looking at more from a qualitative perspective. So I'm looking at like, okay, e-commerce SEO. I look at the search results and I say, okay, is there any like gap here that I can mm. attack? Is there, an, is there an angle that I can bring to this equation that no one else has covered? Now, for the keywords that I'm going after, it's very hard sometimes to find an angle. So if I can't find an angle, I just won't even go after it. So I'll give you an example. In 20, I think it was 2016, maybe it was 2018, somewhere in that range, um, I wanted to rank for the keyword best CMS for SEO, okay? Mm. Very, very competitive keyword. You have HubSpot and you have all these crazy strong websites, okay? So, and I looked at it, I'm like, man, I don't know if I can rank for this, but I, I looked at the results and one, there was a huge issue that I saw with the results, like a huge gap. And the gap was that every single piece of content ranking was just the generic listicle about, you know, WordPress, Shopify, you know, just your kind yeah, of generic yeah, yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, and I was like, okay, I think what I could do, because if this is the best CMS for SEO, what if I could find some data that could prove that a particular CMS is better than, you know, than another, right? Mm. So what I did is like, all right, I'm going to create this data study. And so uh, I ended up analyzing, I think it was 10,000 keywords. So 10,000 keywords, I worked with my, my virtual assistant and I also used this software to kind of, to uh, analyze it um, and come to find out WordPress was the best, right? Uh, now your CMS does not necessarily equate to SEO performance. However, certain CMSs out of the gate are built better for SEO, right? Mm. So it's not that like if you have a WordPress site, you're going to be Shopify. Like that's not exactly the hmm. the case because obviously it's it's the driver, it's not the car, right? Yeah. So, um, but but it there is some there at least the correlation is that the majority of the sites that are ranking were WordPress driven websites, uh, mm -hmm. or the other large percentage was that it was uh, websites that uh, actually didn't even have a CMS, so like a headless mm -hmm. CMS. A lot of a lot of sites like that. 
Um, so anyway, I, I created that case study and I launched it and it started to do really, really well and it started to get links naturally. Uh, and funny enough, from 2018 until actually just last year, that thing dominated, dominated. Wow. And funny enough, I uh, in the content, this is like a little experiment, uh, in the content I said, this content is intentionally short. I'm intentionally making this content short. It has a low word count. I put it at the hmm. bottom. And I'm like, and I guarantee this will still rank. So wow. I was proving that word count didn't matter, right? Because I knew that if, if you created a good linkable asset and it attracted links, that it, that would be the thing that would be way more important uh, overall. So, and I, I was proven right in that one regard. And so that asset did really, really well for a long time. And then 2023, it started to slip. Right, starting mm -hmm. to fall, and I watch the rankings starting to fall a little bit. And I track. I always, I'm a big fan of individual keyword tracking, even to this day. I think I know people are like, oh, don't do that. You should just track it. No, I like specific keyword tracking because I mm -hmm. can see over time what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so it started to slip, and then it fell down to like the second page. I'm like, ooh, okay, I think I need to do something. Now, my uh, my theory as to why it was falling was because it became outdated. Right, mm. it just the the data became outdated. It came a little stale, and you know. And so I, I was like, "All right, well, what do I do? Well, I'm just going to do an updated study." So, so then <laughs> yeah. I did the study. I did the study again, and I did it for 20, 2024. And so it was actually kind of cool because now I have like the the benchmark of I think it was twenty six. I think it was twenty sixteen. Maybe I think I'm getting that wrong. Somewhere around that time, uh, I had the benchmark and I had the most recent data. And so now you could see like which CMSs have either climbed or so like Duda now is a CMS that a lot of people use. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's come up the ladder. That was that didn't even exist when I did the study the last time. Uh, Webflow it was up high on the list. Now that didn't even exist when I did the first study. So I have this kind of like you know really unique data that's there, and now it's it's ranking well again. Right. So wow. um, so just an idea. That's kind of like where that's the kind of uh, process that I'm going through. Uh, but like I said, the, the main reason I was telling you that is because finding an angle. And I'll spend a lot of time thinking about that, like a ton, because uh, it's so important. It's so, so important because you don't, in this day and age where anyone can, you know, and I say in this day and age, that's exactly how AI always starts its, its articles, right? Yeah. In this day and age, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sound just like an AI now. Um, uh, but, uh, but it is true because like AI, you know, it, anyone can do it. Anyone can uh -huh. create a generic piece of content now. Seriously. Like anyone, anyone can just go in there and create a very decent average piece of content that mm -hmm. like you don't even need to outsource it anymore. Like if you just want to create a really average piece of content, anyone can do it. Mm. I mean, it's just a fact. I think actually AI has made content better across the board because prior to that point, you would have to outsource it to a non-native English speaker mm, yeah. and it would be really, really bad, like mm -hmm. super bad. Now we're at a point where it's like, okay, everyone can be mediocre. Everyone can be average. Right? Like, that is the bear. That's like the barrier right now uh -huh. at this point. Uh, but to beat everyone else, a little bit more effort, a little bit more effort goes a long way. And that's just, that's just my philosophy. I think it's like, you're either trying to be, Christopher Nolan, or you're trying to be Gary Vee. Mm. And both approaches work. They can both work, right? But I just lean more towards like, I'd rather invest a lot of time in one asset. And that way, at least when I publish it, I know that I did everything I can to actually wreck, right? Instead of being like, oh, I know we're going to have to try to like upgrade this in three months from now because it actually kind of sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just a different philosophy. So yeah. Yeah. No, awesome. I, I love your approach and how detailed you are. Like, I, I guarantee almost no one is willing to put, you know, 10, 20, 30 hours into a blog. And that's why they're getting beat by people like you. Um, so I mean, SEO at the end of the day is all about competition, right? So I mean, there's yeah. only one person that's ranking number one on that term. And usually the person that's doing it right and doing it the best is going to win. And I kind of just want to get a little technical on this just to drive this home. What specifically do people need to add on these pages, on any you know pages or blogs to make them rank? Is there a certain amount of headings or do you need to make sure that you add images? Are you putting the keyword in the title, the H1? Like, give me some technical stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, once you've got the angle squared away, and obviously, you know, the the concept of an angle gets a little tricky depending on the type of content you're creating. So like I'm using content very broadly here, but really it's in reference to uh, informational content, which would live on a blog, but also commercial pages like, uh, you know, pest control services in St. Louis, mm -hmm. right? And people think that pages like that, that you, you like, uh, you can't differentiate, right? But you can, you can differentiate mm -hmm. on those pages too. Um, but the, the thing is like, that's important. It's like figuring out the angle, figuring out the differentiation. That's like the lead domino of everything else. I think personally, once you get that going, uh, and by the way, differentiation doesn't always have to be monumentally like different. Like in some cases, like the whole idea is completely different than everyone else. But sometimes it can just be like the fact that your, your page is faster than everyone else's. Hmm. Like that, yeah. it, it can be, it can be smaller things or maybe, uh, all top 10 of your competitors all have stock photos and you actually went out to the job site and took real photos uh -huh. in that specific city, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's differentiation. So it's not necessarily like the angle. It could also be like the elements that live on that page where you could have differentiation. Um, and so that that's kind of a very important point, but from a technical perspective, uh, my process is very simple. Find a keyword that whatever website we're working on that we can actually rank for. And when I say that, that means um, the authority of the site that we're working on matches or exceeds at least one or two competitors for that keyword, mm. right? So looking at like the overall site authority is really, really important. I want to see like, is there someone in our range that's doing well here? And if there is, then I say, okay, let's, let's attack this one. But if I only see like dr90 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 i'm gonna say let's maybe go to yeah, a different yeah. keyword okay uh so and that and it's a very important distinction because i'm not looking at the links going to the individual pages i'm looking at the overall strength of the mm -hmm. site which is way more powerful uh mm -hmm. you know as a factor in my opinion um now that's the first part once you got that figure out, let's assume we've got a good keyword then um next thing is is to build out uh, a content outline now this can be done in two ways. You can do it manually or you can do it with ChatGPT, right? Um, it just kind of depends on the complexity of the content. If it's, it's something I'm writing where I know I have to like really bring my A game, I'm probably going to manually build it out. Uh, if it's something like a commercial page for a local business that's not super competitive, probably going to use ChatGPT to build out that mm -hmm. outline, right? Um, now, the key here is with the outline, you want to use NLP to build that outline. And so what I do is like, I'll copy the NLP keywords from rankability and I'll put them into chat GPT. I'll say, okay, create me an outline based on these NLP keywords. And by the way, for, for people that don't know, what is NLP? Uh, natural language processing, just geeky terminology, basically that is just, uh, relevant ideas, technically entities, but really relevant ideas that are pulled out of the content. Uh, and so the, the reason why it's important is because Google can't read. Right, like Google can't read and Google can't objectively measure the quality of content. So what it does to try to figure out like what you know what to do with this page that has just been indexed. First of all, and going back to what you're talking about, like specifically where to place keywords, uh, it's first thing it's going to do is scan the headings, right? Mm -hmm. And scan the title tag, meta description, H1, H2. It's going to look at those things and see, okay, can I figure out what you know what this is about, right? Um, and so that's why it's so critical going back to kind of like on page SEO 101, um, the quantity of headings doesn't matter, right? Mm. That doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, I know there's been some studies that have said like the quantity of unique images might play a role potentially. Uh, but I think it's more about having unique images. So like yeah. for me, it's like, um, everything must be unique on a page. That's my criteria mm, and that's good. images, videos, content, it all needs to be unique. I hate stock photos. Yeah. Like, yeah. like local business, like if you're a roofer and you get a stock photo, why would you do or that? AI, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you're a roofer, go and take a picture of you on the job. Like you, mm -hmm. you have like everyone has an iPhone, like iPhones take beautiful pictures. Like, mm -hmm. They like everyone has the ability to take good pictures these days. Um, so everything should be unique on the page, but as far as keyword placement, title tag, meta description, 
uh, in the H1, which is the actual visible, obviously, uh, heading that shows on the page. Uh, users don't see the time tag, right? Just it's in the code. The users don't see the meta description. It's in the code, uh, but you see it when you're on the Google on Google search. So uh, title tag, meta description, H1. I like to get it in the first sentence as well. Mm. Uh, and then typically some sort of variation of the keyword in the, in the first H2. So like, to me, that's like bare minimum on page SEO. And like, funny enough, I'm, the, the, uh, the article I'm doing right now in e-commerce SEO, like I looked up, uh, I think it's bowling shoes. Okay. And I went to page two and I found some competitor. I mean, these guys are ranking on page two and they don't even have like their title tag is just shoes. Yeah. I know. I've right. Seen that. Like. Like, and, and you know, we're, I'm not talking about like advanced level SEO. I'm saying like, just add bowling to, you know, bowling shoes in the title tag, their rankings will go up three spots mm -hmm. just from doing mm -hmm. that. I mean, it, it's crazy. Like sometimes little tiny actions have big impact in SEO. So keyword placement, bare minimum stuff that has to happen on any page you're trying to rank. The next level of this obviously is the NLP, as I mentioned, which is really the objective of NLP is just to make the most relevant page possible. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the number one objective. So that's kind of the process that I will go through. And then, you know, obviously the writing and all that stuff, that's kind of where the, that's where the art comes in. So, uh, you know, that's, I can't really like, there's certain things I can, I, I can talk about, but it's, there's some magic that goes on there that I can't really yeah. explain. Yeah. No, that's okay. No, you, you already revealed a lot. I know there's yeah. kind of a lot of magic in this game of SEO and kind of to, um, partly off of what you were saying. Yeah, that's why I love doing local SEO because it's so much easier. Like mm -hmm. th these these keywords are such low difficulty. The, the competitors don't know what they're doing. No one knows what they're doing in the local space. No. And something that you were saying is that, you know, adding keywords into the, you know, like the headings is a quick win. Are there any other quick wins that, you know, SEO agencies or, you know, local businesses should be taking advantage of for local? I mean, quick wins, obviously putting the keywords in the right spots. I mean, that's mm -hmm. like hands down the fastest thing that you can do. Um, there's only one other technique that I can say reliably works like almost every time, as long as you do it the right way, which is a, uh, a an upgrade of any page that you're trying to rank. Hmm. So like, uh, like I mentioned with the best CMS for SEO, uh, that page got stale. Google didn't like it anymore. It just started to fall and I did an upgrade. I did a refresh, I did an upgrade, and that brought it back to life. Every time I do that, I love upgrades. It's like it's like my number one go-to tactic. Um, and so the key to this is like, if you're gonna do, like for example, I did a big, um, a, big, a big audit for a SaaS company, okay? And they had a page that was, re they were really like frustrated by it. Just wouldn't rank. They're like, why is this thing not ranking? Well, number one, it was all AI content. So that was an issue. But n number two was what I like to do is I will, uh, I'll do view page source with Google Chrome and I'll look in the code. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to see how fresh that page is. So, mm. and what I, what I do is I, I started searching like, okay, 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. and there's all this old outdated stuff in, in the code, right? Mm. Old images from 2018 and CSS files that are from 2019 and, mm. Remember, like Google is just a bot. It yeah. doesn't like it doesn't doesn't objectively know things really. It's just looking at the page and says, oh, "Okay, this is outdated." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, its conclusions are very fast. It's not, <laughs> and so so I've actually tested this rigorously. And like I had a page uh, SEO for roofers, okay, and just to test this. I was like, all right. And that was another page I kind of had started to like fall a little bit. So like it's a perfect opportunity. So all I did was I took the same exact, I didn't even change the content. All I did was replace all of the images. I replaced all the images, re-uploaded them so they would have a fresh file name for that year and then changed the publish date on the asset. Boom, number one. No like, way. Yep, yep. And I've done that multiple times. And it, they were the same exact images. All I did was just re-upload them so the file name was consistent with the year. Wow. Um, and so you want to talk about quick wins. <laughs> yeah. There you go. No, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> so, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That, like, and, and I was going to say, like, that's not going to work every time, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do have to do like, okay, this page sucks. Let's rebuild it from scratch. That does cool. happen. So, cool. Yeah. All right, I want to talk about backlinks now. I I know you're actually a huge fan of backlinks. Can you just quickly 
tell like specifically in the local scene how important are backlinks do do people need them how often do you need them what role do they play it's it's always based on competition right i mean like i i try to view seo as like i'm i'm fighting very specific battles right mm. and so like yes uh if you're in the personal injury space you're probably going to need backlinks right but if you're like i don't know you're a hot dog stand in Chesterfield, Missouri, <laughs> you probably aren't going to need a lot of backlinks, right? You don't mm -hmm. need that much firepower to, to really make it work. So I think competition is a big, a big part of it, but I'd say most campaigns, like you're going to need some backlinks, uh, mm -hmm. because it is, it is truly, especially with AI now, it is truly the number one signal that even AI can't replicate, mm -hmm. right? You it just can't. I mean, you can't replicate a real backlink. It's just, it's a real backlink from a website that has editorial standards. Um, and you, you can't, you can, you can buy them, of course. You can fake them, but at least with, you know, it, it, is, a, it is a point of differentiation. Um, and, and, I, and if you view from the perspective that they're votes, it makes perfect sense. Now, yeah. on the local level, uh, the, what people get wrong, and I, I see this a lot, is they get links that are not relevant in any way. Mm. So, for example, you know, you, you, let's say you start a campaign for a pest control company in St. Louis, okay? And this is what some SEO companies will do. They say, okay, we need to get links. Let's go to a link vendor and let's just buy like these mommy blogs. Let get, let's get links on all these mommy blogs and then link mm -hmm. to our pest control company. I mean, come on. You don't, you don't <laughs> have to be a rocket. I mean, like... You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that Google's going to be like, uh, this is a little weird. Yeah. Why is a mommy blogger in California linking to a St. Louis pest control company? Mm. Now, there are ways to do this that make it look and appear more natural. Um, so, cause, cause the way that most people do is they, it's totally unnatural and it leaves a massive footprint. So what they'll do is they'll get a mommy blog link and then they'll link like to their homepage, right? Or they'll link to like a, some geo-targeted lead generation page, yeah, like yeah. some page that doesn't deserve links. Now the way to, um, and I'm not t telling people, uh, how to manipulate Google. Okay. I'm just stating how to make it appear more natural. Okay. And the way to make it appear more natural is instead of just slamming your homepage or slamming a service page, create some sort of linkable asset, mm. right? So uh, in St. Louis, it might be something like um, something about cicadas. Okay, we had cicadas this mm -hmm. you know uh, this summer. So some sort of data driven piece of content about cicadas in St. Louis. Okay, and the influence that they have on the trees and on your house and all these things. Okay, uh, and you could do this a whole data-driven piece of content. Then you go to the mommy blogs, and then you link to your data-driven piece of content. Mm. Now you've muddied the waters. Okay, okay. You've muddied the waters because now, well, is it? Uh, and then if the algorithm can't really decipher, that's what you want. Right? Mm. So that's, and I'm, I'm speaking in terms of people who buy links, you know, that, but it's the same philosophy if you're doing outreach, the same philosophy if you're trying to do it in a you know, clean way. Uh, I believe linking to linkable assets is the best thing to do because it's the safest, it's the most natural, it doesn't leave a footprint. So usually the first thing we're doing in a campaign is like build one to three linkable assets like that for local. Um, and I don't care, like, I'm not trying to build topic authority. I'm just trying to build out assets that deserve backlinks. So interesting. Okay. And then what else would you recommend someone do for backlinks for local? So create a couple linkable assets. That's the first thing. Uh, and then the second thing is focus heavily on the city that you're targeting. So, uh, so first thing we'll do is we'll look for sponsorship opportunities. Uh, cause, because I love getting, like, if I'm a St. Louis pest control, let's say, let's go even more specific, a Chesterfield pest control company. Okay. Um, I want to get a link from the Chesterfield baseball league. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get a link from the Chesterfield theater. I want those links because what it's telling Google is that you're a part of that that city. You're a you're a business that operates in that location. Uh, most importantly, if you're operating in the city and you're not in the Chamber of Commerce, you look really sketchy. Mm. It's just a fact. 
Like, why are you not in the Chamber of Commerce? That's a little weird. All your competitors are, but you're the only one that's not. So, yes, shell out the whopping 90 bucks a year to be in the Chamber of Commerce, right? Like, th that small little details like that make a big difference. So for me, I'm looking at localized opportunities more than anything else. Even a small one, like um, I got interviewed for uh, KSDK in St. Louis, just like a news outlet. Um, I did it for my book. And I scored like a DR73 do follow link from that. Nice. Like, and, and specifically a St. Louis link, like very, very relevant. Um, and so like it, the opportunities are all around. I mean, mm. anything that has local, like that local relevance is going to be big time as far as performance. So, and there's tons of opportunities. I mean, tons. So, and they're dirt cheap too, compared to going national. So awesome. Yeah. Okay, I've got a pretty wild question, which I've I've always kind of wondered, and I've I don't know, I, I usually don't take on projects like this, but what do you think about let's say a company is starting from scratch or they basically have nothing. Like let's let's say less than ten traffic a month, you know, maybe zero DR, you know, two DR AS, whatever you want to call it, basically yeah. no links. Is there like potential for this company? Like, are they screwed and is everyone else beating them or how can they build up from zero? No, I mean, it just depends on what they're up against. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to like start in a software company in, you know, uh, CMSs, for example, yeah, yeah, you are about to fight a serious war. Yeah. <laughs> you probably, you better have a 10 year plan to fight that war. Wow. Right. Um, but if you're just starting a, like a pest control company in Chesterfield, it's very doable. Now, the thing is like, I'll just give you like, for example, my strategy with rankability.com. Okay. This will kind of give you an idea because we're starting mm -hmm. from scratch, right? Brand new website. It's, you know, six months, six, seven months old, basically at this point. Um, and so people are wondering like what I'm going to do for SEO on that site. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to find is I don't, I, I haven't published any content on that site. What? And, and the reason is because I am not going to publish content until we build up a lot of authority. Hmm. And on top of it, I already have a DR73 with gotcha.co.com. Okay. So does it make more sense to publish content on the fresh domain or does it make more sense to publish on the site that already has a lot of authority? Okay. Right? So most of the content is being published there, but once rankability starts to catch up and it's got some traction, then I start to publish. Um, hmm. And this is kind of reverse to what a lot of people push these days, which is just create a ton of content to cover the topic. I am not a fan of that at all. That is not my strategy. Um, I actually have a, I have a website that I've talked about on other interviews and uh, in my content. Yeah. It's St. Louis SEO consultant.com. Okay. So if you look up St. Louis SEO consultant, I think if you look up St. Louis SEO, this site ranks. Okay. And this is one page. It is just a one page website. So how is a one page website crushing all of these agencies that have multiple pages, have been around for years, X, Y, Z. Okay. How is that possible? Well, number one, I'm using an exact match domain. They're stupidly overpowered. Wow. I think you know this because yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, uh, a good one. <laughs> and I like it. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, but that's big, big piece. If you use that well, it's really, really powerful. Uh, but the second piece is I spent all my time just driving links to the site. Just mm. links, 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 links. I just keep hitting it over and over. And then when it gets to number one, then I can take my foot off the gas. Mm. But that's that's all that that's the way that I like to do things. And even if I publish a new asset, I was actually talking about this yesterday with uh, the Academy members. Like a lot of people, what they do is they publish a new SDO asset. And like, oh yeah, that felt good. And then they go and start writing the next one. Mm. And it's like, well, what about the one you just published? You're just going to let that one die? Like you're not even <laughs> going to like give it any love. Mm -hmm. um, like it need, like when you publish a piece of content, it needs signals. It needs external signals. Uh, there are some internal signals you can send to it. You can send internal links to a new asset. That's one thing I would recommend doing. Like any new asset you publish, look for internal linking opportunities to give it a little bit of traction. But if, the work isn't done after you publish. It's just begun. Mm. Right. The work has just begun because now you have to figure out, okay, how do we actually drive positive signals to this page so that Google who's tracking everything that we're doing knows that this page, the users like this page. So mm. one of the techniques that I will often use, 
especially if I spend a lot of time on a piece of content, I'm not going to like not promote it. I'm going to go try to promote as much as I can. So first thing I'll do, send an email to my list, right? So that way I get an immediate flow of traffic going nice. to that page. And what will happen is, okay, now it's starting to get some user signals. People are sharing it. People are scrolling. People are clicking. Good things are happening, right? And that can give you some good positive momentum out of the gate. It won't be enough to get you going, but maybe two or three people in there also have websites and now they see this content, maybe they link to it, right? So getting eyeballs on your content is the way to get more links. You need eyeballs. Mm. Now, the second part of this is if you don't have a list, then just advertise that content, right? So like run a Facebook ad, throw a hundred bucks at it and start driving positive signals to that page, right? And that's what I started thinking. I was like, how do I drive signals to this page? Traffic, links, whatever it is. And I'm a, I'm a like firm believer of this, that like, if that page is not moving in the right direction, like if it's not picking up rankings every week, then you shouldn't go and publish another asset. Mm. Like you, you should see positive momentum before you move on to the next one, because none of us have unlimited resources. So, you know, you, you just need to, you need to really get focused. So it's just my personal philosophy. I just, I'm a big fan of like hyper focus. Um, and I'm not a fan of just like paying, you know, spraying content all over the internet without any, like, like there's old, there's, there's this, old, uh, this guy, Derek Halpern, who used to be a big blogger, uh, social triggers was the name of his blog. He doesn't blog anymore, but he used to say like, you, when you publish a new piece of content, you should be thinking about like, uh, you're going to spend 20% of your time creating content and the other 80% promoting it. Mm, interesting. And that's always stuck with me. I've always thought about that. So like, if I'm not getting good results, like for, like, I'll catch myself or like my results are like not good in something. I'm like, wait a second, have I been pro even promoting? And then I'll switch back to what I need to do. And then I'm all, mm. I'm on the attack on promotion and everything gets better again. So I've had to teach my lesson, teach this lesson to myself one too many times. So yeah. Because if it was as easy as just publishing content, everyone would be successful. Mm -hmm. It's not that way. Wow. Yeah. Wow, so, man. I mean, I've, I've learned so much from you in this podcast. It is ridiculous. Really a, a ton of good points um, from, you know, building backlinks to how to create quality content. Um, we really covered a lot here and I super appreciate your time. I'd love to ask one more question if I can. Yeah. Is that cool? Please. Okay. Yeah. Like most people are talking about, what is the future of SEO? What, what, what role does AI play? And what, what is the future with you as well? What, what are you working on? Yeah, I mean, I wish I wish I had a crystal ball. Uh, that would be amazing if I knew exactly what was going to happen. But, um, you know, the only thing I know for sure that's going to happen is that it's only going to get better. Hmm. That's going to happen. Like the, the inevitable path that we're going is that the AI is going to progressively get better. Mm -hmm. Um, and I view that as a good thing. I think it makes our work better. I think there's a lot of good things that come from it. Uh, but as far as how it influences SEO, you know, there's going to be some situations you got to be pretty careful of. Um, and one of those is like Google answering questions with the AI. And I think Google's playing nice right now, but I don't think Google's going to play nice in the future. Dang. Um, I, I think, I think Google is saying, yeah, we're going to cite the sources and be super nice about it. But I think there'll be a time where they'll stop citing sources. And I think what they'll do is they'll just put ads in the AI overviews. So just my opinion, I, I, I just follow the money. Just mm -hmm. follow the money and you'll have a good idea of what's going to happen. And uh, Google, their 80% of their revenue comes from search. So they got to make money. They're not doing it for free. That's for sure. So, uh, so yeah, I, I just think that's what's going to happen. So naturally, the, the, the consequence of that is a reduction in clicks in search just naturally mm. going to happen but i think it's going to be definitely case by case basis like informational keywords are the most dangerous like if 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 the ai can easily answer it i don't know if that's a keyword you want to go after right okay um but i think the ones that are safer are the commercial keywords obviously local obviously ecom like things of that nature i think are a lot i hate to use the word safe but let's just say safer than those um but I just think at this point, like trying to predict the future, like it's not, it's not even not even a point of doing it because all you should do is be thinking about how do we uh, do omnipresent digital marketing for this, point. Mm. and that's it. And search is a big search is a big piece of that. Like it's a huge piece because actually 
crazy thing about search is that search actually trains the large language models, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to do well in the large language models, you actually have to do well with SEO. So it's this kind of mm -hmm. weird dynamic going yeah. on. Um, and so SEO is a huge piece. I mean, it should be 25, 30% of your, you know, the, of the pie at least. Uh, but being on social media, building a brand, going on YouTube, having an email list, you know, all those things are really, really important. Um, so, and I, as you know, I'm very bullish on YouTube. So, yeah. but it, you know, but it's, uh, it's even more than that. Like just everywhere, try to be everywhere. It, it, it makes a big difference. So, yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit more about YouTube? I wanted to ask you this earlier. So you've grown to over a hundred thousand subscribers. You've uploaded hundreds of videos. What have you learned and what, what is like your strategy there? Yeah, I've learned a lot. Um, and I, I think it's, I think the most important thing is figuring out what works for your channel. And I think the worst thing to do is look at other channels and be like, oh, I want to be like Mr. Beast or I want to be like, eh. yeah. and like, it's okay to model success. I think that's a good, in the beginning, like when you don't know what you're doing, yeah, just model people who are, or have already done it. But over time, you kind of find your groove and figure out the type of content that your audience really likes. And so for me, it's more, it's, it's a very organic process. Like, like I published a video last week that I thought would do decent and it sucked. It bombed. Right. And so like, I don't, like, I don't take it personally. I just look at it and say, okay, the audience, my audience, something about this video, they didn't like it. Right. Mm. And so I will reverse engineer. I'll say, okay, what was different about this video compared to other ones that did well? And I will do an analysis. And then my next video, I'll try to do better. Right. And of course, this video I did this week did two times better, three times better. Wow. Uh, so I, I just changed it a little bit. So it's, it is, there is no, I wish I could say like, there's like this like templated process you could follow, but you, it's just listening to your audience, right? If, if, you know, if you're like to dislike ratio, like if you have like, I don't know, if it's 80%, something needs to be fixed. Right. Mm. Uh, but if it's like, you know, you're at 98, 97, like you're, you're above 95% on like to dislike ratio. To me, that's a good, a good sign. Right. Okay. Um, but if I see like 90 or below 90, I yeah, start being like, yeah. like something happened here. So figure out what kind of like the averages for your, your channel. And then kind of like, that's where you can start to decipher like, okay, that was a good angle. This one was not. And that's what it's really all about is trying to figure out what the best angle. And then on top of it, it's tiny and as generic as it is, being consistent makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. It really does. I mean, figuring out what your consistency cadence should be is what matters. Like what's a good cadence for yourself. For me, I, I'm, I do well with about one a week. Like mm -hmm. any more than that, I'll crumble. Any less than that, I start getting nervous. So it's, you know, it's like one a week seems to be like a good kind of path for me. Maybe I'll go to one every two weeks or something at some point, but one a week is work for me. So I think figuring out your cadence, and I, I think for most people who are starting, don't even try to do once a week, like set, like set a stupidly achievable goal. Like I'm yeah. just going to publish one video a month mm -hmm. like, for like the first six months. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, then you can move to two videos a month and then do that for three months. So once you've been, once you've proven to yourself that you can do that, okay, now let's move on to a video a week. Too many people, I mean, it's, this happens with everything. I'm guilty of this too. Like anything that's new, we get really excited. Really excited mm -hmm. to do it. You yeah. got that energy, but man, once that wears off, you don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. You just have a really boring routine that you have to follow, which is <laughs> yeah. publish a video every week, and you have to do that over and over, even when you don't want to. Mm -hmm. And that's that's just the way it is. So um, yeah, there, there's other technical stuff, but I think it's it's more of like staying in your staying in your niche. Like so, I think with like with pest control. I'll tell you what some people do in the SEO industry that I don't recommend. Uh, and this isn't because like, I'm afraid of competition, by the way, I don't care. <laughs> if mm -hmm. you want to start, if you want to go broad and be, do a broad SEO channel, like I've done good luck, more power to you, <laughs> right? Like it's very hard, but uh, you know, you can do it. Uh, but I, if you are doing it for the intent to drive business, to drive leads, to drive clients, building a small channel that just focuses on the vertical that you're going after, mm. that's the way to do it. And, mm. The problem why people don't do it is because the vanity metrics influence them to not do it, mm -hmm. right? Because when you when you do 
uh, on page SEO for pest control companies. Yeah. How many views do you think you're going to get? <laughs> yeah, I know. You're yeah, no, I, I, get, I did. You're not going to get a million. Yeah. No, I did so, a complete Google business profile guide. And I mean, it was about as good as I could do it. You know, 200 views, but I mean, that's pretty good for pest control. Yeah. But, but if 10 of those turn into pest control companies reaching out to you, yeah. who cares? No, exactly. Exactly. I, I love, um, uh, what JK Molina says. If you know him, he says likes ain't cash or everyone yeah, is, is everyone is so <laughs> focused on likes and subscribers oh, yeah. and all these vanity metrics. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, like, I mean, what are you here for? And I mean, sure, you can be here to be famous, but I'm here to make money personally. And I think you are Agreed. too. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I, I, honestly, I, I only started YouTube to use it as a lead generation source. Mm -hmm. I didn't like, it's crazy. I have a hundred thousand subs. I, I never even, that never even crossed my mind. I was like, if I get 10,000 subs, that'd be like crazy if I could uh -huh. do that. But the only reason I started YouTube was because I, I just was like, well, I, I know video is going to be important. So I need to be here. That mm -hmm. was my like magical, you know, idea. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that was a pretty magical idea because yeah. it, it, it turned out to this of a hundred thousand subscribers. I'm sure all these opportunities, a ton of new business. So, um, just congrats to you, man. Hats off. I think, Thanks, man. you know, a hundred thousand subscribers still fairly niche. I mean, SEO, and again, it seems like you're more so targeting local, very impressive, man. You're definitely one of the top guys in the space. And I, I have a lot of respect for you. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank man. You. All right. Well, I could ask you questions all day, but I want to be respectful, respectful of your time. So I'll cut out, cut it off here. Um, where can people find you, learn more about you and the stuff that you sell? Yeah. I mean, uh, gotcha is the best place for the Academy, rankability.com, obviously for my software. And then if you just want to see some of my free stuff on YouTube, Nathan Gotch, um, and I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn and stuff, but my, my, my best stuff is on YouTube. I would say in most cases. Cool. So, I would agree. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's so great to have you on, Nathan. Hope to have you on again sometime. And uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Bye.